Sybil believes that according to God's word, her life's mission is to be an exposer of truth and an eraser of error as it relates to finances and living out kingdom principles through stewardship. Silva has been in the financial banking industry since 1994, and she, is, she currently serves as the wealth support specialist for Truist. That's how you pronounce it? Truist. Truist Bank. Silva Walker Financial Coaching was created to help with personal finances by providing financial education coaching, by providing financial education coaching services to develop individualized financial plans. Silva earned her Bachelor of Science in Communications at Miles College. She is a member of the 23rd Street uh, Missionary Baptist Church, Southside. She is a children's leader in Bible Study Fellowship and a Wealth Academy leader with the 23rd Street Wealth Empowerment Academy. Now, Silva, she enjoys reading, watching financial training videos on YouTube, listening to some music, spending time with, with her family, volunteering through trips. Lighthouse Project, the Food Bank, the Dana Project, Hillcrest Behavioral Health Services, and SWAT, which stands for Soul Winning Action Team and the Foundry. She's an amazing woman. Yes, give her a hand. So before I bring her on, let us bow our heads. Father God, we just thank you today, Lord God, for who you are and for all that you have planned for our lives. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. Now, Father, I thank you right now, Lord God, that your wisdom infuses Sybil. Think through her mind and speak through her voice, Father God. So, the, so we will allow you to do, Holy Spirit, what you came to do. And that is to lead and guide us into all truth of who we are in Christ and who you are in us. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Now, Ms. Silva Walker. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. Thank everybody for being here. I'm excited as always. Uh, it's a little tempered on today, but um, believe you me, it elevate in just a little bit of time. So <laughs> uh, thank y'all again for everybody being here. I don't know everybody that's here. And that's a good thing because God has allowed me to uh, be graced with some people who will support me and lift me up and encourage me and I can do the same for you. So because of that, I wanna get to know everybody. So I'm gonna take just a few minutes and ask everybody to just introduce yourself and tell me how you heard about the seminar today. I'm gonna start to my left. <laughs> I do put your great video out. <laughs> I'm Minister Katina Daniel, and I was invited by Miss Bridget um, Andrews. Miss Katina, good to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm Titus Horace, and I was invited by Bridget. Hey, Titus, thank you for coming. Next table. <clears throat> I'm Terry Fournier, and I got a email. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Cornish. I'm Gerald Wright, and Ms. Walker is a client of mine. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Wright. I'm Elisa Potter, and I was invited by my good, good friend, Sybil Walker. And this is my grandson, Kamarion. Hey, Kamarion. <laughs> thank you, Elisa. <laughs> First table. Um, my name is Tobias Phil Walker. Uh, I was invited by my mother-in-law. Uh, Charlotte Reed. I was invited by Ms. Walker. And of course, I'm Clarence Reed, and this is my wife, Charlotte, and we were invited by Ms. Walker. Mm -hmm. Oh, I guess. <laughs> I'm Minister Bridget Phillips. Being those on Facebook, came across it. Uh, called her bestie, told her I was coming, and I wound up here. I'm glad I came today. Yeah, glad you came. <laughs> and my name is Nikia Bright, <laughs> and um, I received a text message. I was invited by Ms. Walker. Laura White, uh, I was invited, text message, Facebook. <laughs> Silver Walker. <laughs> <laughs> Erica Flowers, I was invited by Civil War. Claude Perry, text message. 
<laughs> Civil War. <laughs> Mary Hunter. Uh, Bridget sent it to me on LinkedIn. And I was not coming because I'm supposed to be on the road right now. And Silva sent me a text. And I said, okay, I need to do something after I leave the airport. So that's why I'm here. Okay. Good morning. My name is Audrey Jones. I work with Daryl and Bridget. And I was talking to Miss Mary about it. And she said she was coming. So I said, I'll come too. I want to see what's going on. Uh, Elizabeth Williams, text message my, my buddy, Civil Walk. <laughs> Deborah Bailey, Civil Walk. Okay. Regina Bowser, Civil Walk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you got my right hand, man. Holding the camera as always, Daryl Walker. Thank you so much for coming. You're welcome. And we got Rich's brother. Andre. Adrian. Adrian, sorry. Well, again, y'all, I just want to say thank you, everybody, for coming. I know, as Bridget has said, this information is so, so important, <clears throat> not only in our community, but in any community. We need to make sure if we don't have access to this information on a full-time basis, we get access as often as we can. And so as often as Bridget will allow me and invite me to come to the event center to present this information, I'm going to be available to present it. And y'all, I'll tell you something about me. I, no matter how many sessions or seminars or conferences I speak at and I do, I prepare every one of them as though I've never prepared before. My daughter-in-law asked me this morning, and I want to give her kudos to her live for my makeup today. Y'all know this is definitely not me. <laughs> Mr. General, I just saw me this week, and he's like, this is somebody new. <laughs> yes, I am. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus <laughs> because of what she's done to my face. So when I get home, y'all already know. <laughs> it's already off, but I'm grateful for it. So thank you, Tabitha for taking care of your mother-in-law. I definitely appreciate it, and uh, I feel glamorous, so I hope I look just as <laughs> Thank you for that, thank you for that. <laughs> well listen, let's get started. Me and money, God's way. That's always the mindset that I have when it comes to talking about money. I'm gonna talk about me and how money revolves and evolves around me, but ultimately I wanna talk about God's mindset about it. And so that's de definitely what we're dealing with today. We're looking at, um, hold on, y'all. If I can find my presentation that I just uh, threw out. Hold on. We, we, I really want to just talk about what does God say about money and how, how does money really affect us? You know, are we in a, in a position to where we can tell somebody else about it? Or do y'all feel like we're in a position to where we just got to hold it all to ourselves? I'm in the mindset of believing we got to tell the story once God blesses us to get well what do we do with it at that point if we don't have it why not does God want us to live in poverty no does he want me to have it all for me no he wants us to be able to use it for the kingdom's glory right there's work to be done in the kingdom and guess who's gonna do that work yeah. We're kingdom people, right? So, and listen, this is not a quiet session. I, I like, you know, like the pastor. I need feedback. I need somebody to talk back to me. Can I get an amen? amen. amen. Yeah, thank you. All right, again, as um, I, I've been introduced, Bridget, let me, let me openly for just a moment thank you again for this platform. I don't know of many places that I can go and the doors are always open for me to come and share this information. I'm not, um, <clears throat> I'm not a licensed advisor, I'm a financial coach. And in coaching, my skill set is education. I love to teach, I love to speak, I love to present the information. So I wanna make sure I point out today, there are many areas that I'm not an expert in. I'm gonna give you a lot of information the information that I'm going to share with you, I do have experts that are in the audience today to back this information up. Mr. Jen Wright, as he said, I was, uh, he was invited by me. I'm his client. 
He's been in the industry for how long? I claim 35 years. He only claims 35, <laughs> but we know it's way more than that. Um, so he's here. Um, I, I definitely invited him. Uh, and any anybody that have questions or you need some additional insight on any information, I do have them available. There are some other people that may come. I don't know that are also experts in various um, skill sets. But Mr. Jen Wright, he owns Mainstream Financial Group, group uh, here in Birmingham, um, and he's down on Second Avenue or it's Morris. like Morris Avenue yeah, area. So um, I, I just want to make sure everybody knows that he's available if you have any questions or additional insight that he can um, shed light on. But about me, again, I started my coaching business in 2019. I have been teaching finance since, uh, finance since I was 17 years old, and God really just impressed upon me to make sure I broaden the horizon. Mm -hmm. I'm a daughter, I'm a wife, I'm a mother. I've worked in the industry. I know. Early, I said since 94, but I actually started in, Mo in Mobile in 1993. I'm passionate, y'all, about teaching this type of education. I realize in our community, it's not a lost art, but oftentimes we don't hear enough about it. We're the biggest consumers there are in the world. If you're looking for weed, go to the black community. If you're looking for nails, go to the black community. If you're looking for eyelashes, go to the black community. You can't see it, but you can't buy it. We have to go to other areas to buy it. We consume, but how often times are we able to be the investor ourselves so that other people might invest in us? Um, my mission is to expose truth and to erase error as it relates to stewardship. As a coach, my goal is to help you bridge the gap between what you want to accomplish and what becomes a reality for you. I want you all to think about in your in your um, <clears throat> excuse me in your pamphlets. There's this question that I'm oftentimes asking: What is my why? Why do I do this? Why do I do that? Why am I here? How am I going to get to where I'm supposed to be? This man, I was introduced to him probably about 2019. He's an Austrian neurologist. He's a psychiatrist. And he's a Holocaust survivor. He wrote the book, Man's Search for Me. His name is Vic Victor Frankl. He believes that humans are motivated by something called a will to meaning. Which is, to, which is the desire to find meaning in life. Everything in life has a meaning. He argued that life can have meaning even in the most miserable of circumstances and that the motivation for living comes from finding that meaning. No matter what you find yourself in, find your meaning. Find your why. How do you get out of that? Don't allow your circumstances, your situations, your conditions to keep you bound. Find a reason that you need to get up. Let it be your children. <coughs> let it be yourself. <coughs> let it be your community. Let it be your parents. Find meaning in life. And that's what Victor is talking about. He's finding meaning in, in life, and he says, find your why. Our agenda for today. I want to talk a little bit about the three key principles. Principles of what? Of course, what are we talking about, y'all? Finances. That's right. The key principles of having a mindset that's surrounding wealth. What the numbers report, I definitely want to highlight some um, heavy statistics. Many times when we think about the things that are going on in the world, we don't see it at the, at the uh, larger scale or the broader spectrum or the spectrum. We simply see it from either ourselves, number one, or just the community that we live in. We don't see it in Mount Brook. We don't see it in East Chase. Uh, we don't see it in Huntsville. We just see it here in Birmingham. How do we get out of that mindset? I want to talk about the master's plan for obedient living. And then I got a guide for money management, and then we got a little bit of Q&A, and we're gonna wrap up and get out of here. So principle number one, who's the source? Okay. 
God is. Why do you say that? That's right. Everything. And y'all, y'all, as I was reading, uh, I just finished up the book of Judges, right? And so I try and do just a study every single day. Before I start my day, I started in God's Word. And my daughter called me Thursday, I believe. And she talked, it was Wednesday, Thursday, yes, Thursday. She talked to us about a post that she had seen on Facebook. And it was in reference to, you know how we say, may the Lord watch between. Amen. The post was talking about all of their life, they had been saying that, and they really didn't know that it was a covenant. It was an agreement between Jacob and Laban. If y'all remember the story, Jacob spent 17, 18 years with his uncle. First, he went to get a wife, and that wife was supposed to be who? Rachel. But the uncle fooled him and gave him who? Leah. They, he gave him Leah. Why? She was, the she was the oldest. And so in that culture, the oldest was the one to marry first. And so he gives her Leah. He gives him Leah. And he has to work another seven years. So now we're upon 14 years. And then he says, well, not to send you away empty-handed. Stay on for six more years. So you can take some livestock with you. And so he works another six years for the livestock. And in the midst of him leaving... Laban says to Jacob, when I'm not in your presence and you got my daughters with you, you promise not to take on another daughter. So may the Lord watch between me and you while we're absent one from another. And, you know, and that's the, that's the prayer. And my daughter thought that was a negative thing. I said, no, that's a covenant. When I can't be with you, the Lord watch between you. When I can't see what you're doing, the Lord watch between you. Y'all, in our finances, I'm not in your home. It's you and God. I'm not in the store with you. It's you and God. You have to ask yourself that question. Do I need this or do I want this? That's a, you got to make that covenant between you and God because guess what? One of the things that we're going to talk about is laying out that financial plan, writing out that budget. That's a budget not between me and y'all. That's a budget you're making with yourself because you know what your income looks like. You know what your expenses look like, and you got to be the one to get in control. I can help you to lay that plan out, but ultimately, you got to be the one to stick to it. So, God is the source. Philippians 4 and 19 says, My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He never runs out of ways to supply our needs. Guess why? Because he's the source. The source is our supplier. Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8 says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when he comes. Guess what, y'all? When the heat comes, what does the water? It's all, you know, I can see in my mind, I love cartoons. I can hear him say, activate. Right. <laughs> you know? Activate. Yeah. And that's what the water does. It activates so that those roots don't dry out. Right. That's what God's word does for the believer. It's water for our thirsty, hungry souls. And it does, it does not feel heat when the heat comes. For its leaves remain wet. Green. And it's not anxious in the year of drought. For it does not cease to bear fruit. Yes. Our job is not the source God is the source but it's a channel by which God uses so that we might edify build up enable ourselves if one door closes God is the one who can open another door in our lives bank accounts rise and fall economies they fluctuate they're up and down the stock markets they can go bull or they can go bear but guess what it doesn't matter because who's the source? God. God is the source. So what is wealth? Let's talk about that for just a minute. Oftentimes people want to get rich. But what's the difference in being rich and being wealthy? I want to tell you. 
Alisa, I know you got it. I'm coming back on it. <laughs> For me, wealth is a mindset. When I change how I see myself, based on what God's word says, I'm able to change my circumstances. A mindset that provides security and protection, the ability to acquire assets instead of liabilities. What are assets? What are liabilities? What, an, what is an asset? What your, your home is an asset if you don't have a mortgage on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna throw that out there. If you don't have, a, if you got a mortgage on it right now, it's a liability. That's right. Yeah. Cash, cash. Here you go. Stocks. Stocks and bonds. What else? Rufus and diamonds. Rufus and diamonds. What you say? Your health. Oh my goodness. Your mind. Those are assets that we don't oft, oftentimes we don't think about. And what are liabilities? Those things that you owe. Yeah, those debts. That's right. It's not how much money you make, but it's about how much money you're able to invest. That's what determines your wealth. Oftentimes we want to save. I'm a banker. I've been in the industry for almost 30 years. As Mr. Jen Wright, he said 35. I, you know, I, I look at my mom, and, and next year it will be 30 years as I was processing. I was like, oh, gosh, it's been a long time. But I'm grateful. I know that I haven't been in this industry for this length of time just for civil. I know that God's placed me here so that I can help someone else. I can pour into my community. I can pour into the lives of others. I can pour into my children and their friends. I can pour into someone. So when I think about that, I think about, as you said, my health. God has kept me healthy for this many years. There's a lot of stress on these jobs. There's a lot going on in our workplaces, but God has kept us so that we might still be able to share this news. Wealth allows you not to worry about money, having enough passive income um, from your business and the assets greater than your expenses. And that passive income is money that works for you while you're sleeping, right? While you're sleeping, your money is still working. When you go to sleep and you got stuck, guess what happens? It's still working. It's still doing. People are still going to Walmart shopping. One of the things I tell people, and I know this is a question that Bridget oftentimes asks me, what stock do I buy? Uh, I'm not a, a financial advisor. I don't do stocks for my job. I do buy stock for me personally. And I tell her all the time, if you or a consumer of it, buy the stock in it. If you're a Walmart shopper, buy stock in Walmart. If you're, um, who's got their phones? Everybody grab your phones really fast and just go to Google. I love to do this exercise because I, I throw people like, like off like tremendously. On your phone in Google, all I want you to type in is Amazon stock. Just type in Amazon stock. And I want you to tell me the price per share of Amazon stock. Because a lot of people want to have stock at Amazon because we all buy from Amazon. Unfortunately, because the stock is so expensive, it's going to take me a minute to accumulate that one share. What's the price per share? Amazon is at $138 a share. So Amazon has come down tremendously. So I can buy stock in Amazon today. Yeah, it's time to buy. It's time to buy stock. I always tell people when you're buying, when you're buying, when you're purchasing stock, buy when the prices are, and then you sell when the prices go. Yeah, when the price go up after you bought it, it's time to sell it. It's okay to sell it. I'm not gonna say it's time to sell it. It's okay to sell it, but buy it when it's low. Buy, you know, if you're if you're buying, uh, go to type type in Apple stock. Let's see what the price of Apple stock is. Apple stock has um, has split. And I think it was a hundred and something a share, but before that it was four hundred and something a share. One seventy one. So it's 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 elevating. It's 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 going back up. It was one nineteen maybe about three months ago, but now it's going back up. So now that it's going up, now it's not the best time to buy. But it's still, honestly, it is still time to buy because that stock is going to go back up to four hundred, five hundred, six hundred dollars a share. Think about places that you. Um, Places that you eat at. 
McDonald's. I don't eat really McDonald's, but um, Chick Fil A, Irving Cookhouse. I don't know Applebee's. Applebee's. Look at the stock. If you find yourself going to those places one, two, three times a month, buy stock. Buy stock in those companies. One of the reasons why I tell people to buy stock in those companies, when your voice needs to be heard about something that's going on with that company, they can hear your voice better as a stockholder versus just being a consumer. As the, the mindset is, as a consumer, you all you want is the product, but as a stockholder, you want the company to prosper, and the companies know that. Remember, don't put your hope in your wealth. Proverbs 23 and 5 says, be rich in good deeds. According to Ephesians 2 and 10, be generous and willing to share. Generous people are synergistic. They build organizations and they contribute to the success of others. That word synergistic simply means that it's an interaction of two things that come together to produce something greater than if it was that one thing by itself. That's that synergistic, we're coming together. So what does it mean to be rich? Rich is having lots of money, but also having lots of debt, lots of expenses. Tangible items, working to build your business to the point that all the money you make does not go out to buy the bigger expenses that you want. Don't work for the money, guess what I need you to do? How does your money work for you? Investing. That's, and I, again, I stress that by investing. And I, and, I, and I know this session, I won't talk about investing on a broader scale, but it's so important. Now, I'm not talking even about just investing in the stock market. It can be investing in real estate. For those of you who love, um, how many of y'all are Prince fans? I just want to throw that in early on. Oh, thank y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My husband is, you know, he's a little envious of the fact that there are millions of us in the world. But, you know, if you're into out buying albums, those, those albums are going to appreciate in value based on the condition that they're in. You have people all over the world that are looking to purchase those. So hang on to them. Riches correspond with self-indulgent hearts. The wealthy see themselves as stewards of God's gifts and manage their possessions in ways that honor him. The riches of the young ruler of Luke 18 skewed his thinking and blocked his union with Christ. But Lydia, who was a seller, a dealer in purple, she worshiped God and she was baptized. Don't let money skew your view. We need to see God above all else. If the money gets too big and too fancy and, and is floating past us too frequently, maybe we can't see God. But, you know, I just want to pause there for just a minute because God knows how much you can handle and he knows how much I can handle. I hear people say all the time, God won't give you no more than you can bear. I knock that. God won't give you no more than he can bear. He can allow, he can bear the load. There's some things we can't handle. That's why we need to rely on him. He takes us in those phases to where we can totally trust him. Principle number two. What's principle number one? God is the source. God is the source. Principle number two, money is about discipleship. So money is a tool that God uses to help us live and love like Jesus. Regardless of how much or how little, money you have God is at work in you in your life through your circumstances he's leading you to a deeper trust in him this is exactly what Philippians 4 11 and 12 is saying not that I am speaking of being in need for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger and abundance, but I also know that there's need. A disciple. A disciple is a person who follows a teacher, a leader, a philosopher. He believes and adheres to what the teacher teaches and what the teacher believes. 
A disciple accepts and assists in spreading the teacher's doctrine. Isn't that what Jesus told us? Are we not his disciples? You know, when I look at scripture, the one thing I'm reminded of with scripture is, the scripture was written for the believers. When people who don't believe in Christ don't read or don't believe God's word, it wasn't written for them. And I know that's a mountain, y'all, but that's the truth. God's word was written for God's people because it's his love story to his people. What father writes a love letter to a son that he's estranged to? It doesn't happen. But the father writes it to us because he wants to know, he wants us to know just how much he loves us. As a believer in Jesus, we are to engage in discipleship. We are to assist him in spreading the gospel. And we are to teach future disciples to adhere to everything that Jesus taught. Jesus did exactly. Um, he's telling us to do what he's done. Guess what message Jesus has, y'all? He has a message from God. He's not said anything that God hasn't said. Everything you hear the son say, he's repetitiously saying it because he's heard the father say it. And guess what we're supposed to be? Imitators. Amen. Our language has to be the language of the kingdom. Our message has to be the message of the gospel. Nothing different. Fi financial discipleship. It attempts to highlight one aspect of discipleship. The management of money and wealth as taught by Jesus and the Bible. Money and wealth, when misunderstood and misused, pose a real danger to, uh, to being a con committed person, right? We can't be that disciple that God wants us to be because we're consumed by our wealth, our money. Money problems are really about money. Guess what they really are about? Yeah. It's about our mindset. It's about our heart. And God knows that. Mark 10, 23 through 27, Jesus tells his disciples that it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. And y'all, you know, I, Bridget shared in my bio, I love to read. And oftentimes, um, I know my children, uh, I, I, my daughter-in-law, I remember her asking, um, what, what was it you, you asked about movies and things that my children watched as children? Oh. And my son said, we didn't watch movies. My mom only made us read. <laughs> and that's true. I, I, I'm a bookworm, and I've always been, and I don't know how to stop. I don't know how to turn it off. But as I read this scripture, I thought about the eye of a needle. In a city, in Jerusalem, there is a gate. And that gate, in order for the camel to go over into the other part of the city, he had to go through that narrow way. And it was impossible, nearly, for him to go through. Everything had to be unloaded from him in order for him to go through that. But he had to make his way into that. Y'all, that's our lives. Sometimes we got some things on us. We got to take those weights off. We got to let them go so that we can go through. The, we got to go through that impossible door. That's what God wants for us. We're his ambassadors. We're citizens of a most high God. We're citizens of the kingdom. In order for us to get there, we got to take some of this stuff off. We got to let it go so that we can ha grab a hold of Now, am I telling you to let go of your wealth, your wealth and your riches? No, no, no. I'm not saying that because if he gave it to you, he meant for you to use it. But he meant for you to use it for his glory. Not to scarf your nose or to pretend that you're better than anybody else. No, you can help somebody. This is kingdom business. This is work. Bridget runs a business to where she's always, 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 always <laughs> lifting people up, giving them a platform, and she doesn't charge a dime. I tell her this opportunity that you give us time and time again, other communities, they're charging for this. I'm laughing at Brother Forney not because he's joking, always. <laughs> In his own way. <laughs> in his own way. <laughs> uh, he's serious in some ways, but in his own way, I think he and I can take the joke. Come into a financial literacy session, you're going to spend $50, $60. Mm -hmm. 
Richard didn't charge anything. You guys came out of your pocket for $10, with $10. Why? Because you wanted to say civil. You're worth more than that. But because that's what you're asking for, I'm on my way to see that, see you for that reason. So thank y'all again. I just want to say I appreciate every person that pressed your way. Saturdays are some of our only day of getting so many things done. But you put off to be here and support. I want to make sure you get this information. Y'all know, I, I keep telling you I'm, I'm challenged with technology. The benefits of discipleship. Now, the, there, a disciple has benefits. It's, there's a benefit in being a disciple. Number one, you get the promises of God. And then number two, you get God instructions. You get to hear what the Father is saying to you. God promises to always provide for our needs, Matthew 6. He promises to provide you with opportunities and the resources you need to share with others, 2 Corinthians 9. He reminds us that we are to be generously um, as we provide all that we need. He's generous to us. Always have everything we need and plenty, even some left over, so that we can do what? Share with others. With his instructions, we're to share the good news with everybody. The good news is what? We call it the gospel. What is the gospel? His word. What, what, what does his word consist of? Truth. Truth. Life. And promises. Jesus came. He lived. He died. But early that third day morning, God raised him from the day. He says, tell that message everywhere you go. Tell the world that story. What does the living entail? It wasn't just that he walked the dusty streets. He healed. He forgave. He raised. Those are some of the things that Jesus did. He taught us, including his financial principles, that every disciple is also a good steward. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. What does that remind us? We're to teach all nations. This message has to go forth. A disciple is to be impactful. If your household's primary financial decision maker died today, how well equipped would the survivor be to make decisions? If that person is you, what happens to your family now that you're the one making those decisions? Are you well equipped? Are you somewhat equipped? Are you not well equipped? You have no experience at all. Where do you stand? Clarence, I ask you if something happened to you with your household. Does Denise know what your wishes are for your household? Is it already in writing? No, we don't always put it in writing, but that's the thing that we've always discussed throughout our years of what is uh, Need, if anything happened to either one of us or either both of us, you know, we make sure our boys and um, our kids are well taken care of and they know what's going well. Amen. Sister White, I ask you the same. Mm -hmm. If you run your household, I try to. <laughs> if something happened to you, does your family know what your, your wishes are? Uh, yeah, it's in the file cabinet, everything. Uh, it's, writ it's written out, and, and policies and everything. Thank you. Daryl, if something happens to you, something happens to me, <laughs> does your family know what the final wishes are? We have our will set. Um, the only thing is we don't know all the passwords. We have to get all that together. <laughs> I handle pretty much everything in the household and you're exactly right so I got some homework to do because I oftentimes write all this stuff down and put it all together and I have it all lined up but I forget if something happens to me he, you know, he can't even get access to it he's on the phone calling the children what's your mom password <laughs> 
I think is important, as you said, to know, to have it written, to have it in the file cabinet. It's so important for us to have our business and our affairs in order. I'm going to talk on the second half of our session more about that because I just want to make sure everybody has access to put it in. You know, things are changing uh, daily as far as uh, getting things together. Do you think it's wise to try to go back and update things or oh. is it? You're still in my thunder. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's so important, Sister White. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's so important to review, 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 review. Most of y'all that are in here know that um, in June and in July, I had two back-to-back -back deaths. My biological father passed on June the 11th. My dad that raised me for 49 years passed away on July 11th, 30 days apart. <clears throat> in the midst of my um, my dad, I'm just going to say my, my biological dad was Robert, my dad that raised me was Richard. In the midst of Richard's passing, we were in the process of getting his will done and before we can finalize everything, he passed away. Now we have to go through the red tape of getting everything um, you know, run through the estate of. So, and many of you have the same experience. Many of you know what it's like to go through the experience of a loved one dying and what all you got to do to try and get everything finalized. Yes. It's not easy. Y'all, and this, that's why this session is so important because while you're in your right mind and you're emotionally okay right now to get it together, now is the best time. The worst time is when someone passes away because you're so emotionally unstable. Uh, it's hard to make a good decision uh, without it being an emotional decision. Sometimes you'll overspend. Sometimes you'll get you'll you close yourself in. You don't want to deal with anybody. You totally turn everything off. So it's a good time to get it done now. So yes, ma'am, it's best to have a review of um, your will, your life insurance policy. Many times you'll take out a life insurance policy when you're younger, and the person that you have on it as your beneficiary, sometimes they've already passed away. And you've never gone back and updated it. So it's, it's a great idea to go in and update it. We are stewards of God's resources. And as stewards, it's important for us to consult with wise counsel counselors. With our bodies, we consult our doctor. With our soul, we consult our pastors. For love and connection or companion, we consult our spouses or our therapists if we need to sit at the table and talk about our spouses. For the food gurus, guess who we contact? For us, we contact Sister Doris McMillan, who is our health and wellness expert in church. <laughs> but many times we'll get with the nutritionists. With our money, we should consult a financial broker, a coach, a banker, a planner, an advisor, an attorney, and an insurance agent. All of those people are important for us to get in contact with. And I'm going to go more in depth about that in just a little bit. It's time for us to have the master's mindset about wealth as we get our houses in order. Third principle, give. I know some of you are talking about investing and, you know, building wealth. And how do I build wealth when I'm giving it all away? <laughs> I say give generously. The more you give, what happens? Yeah. The songwriter says, the more he give, you give, the more he gives to you. So because that you can be God. Oh, man. We got to say that with, with some kind of fire because I think we forgot that one, right? Let's, let's do that one again. You can't be God. No matter how hard you try. The more you give, so because it's really true that you can be God's gift. No matter how you try. Amen. I don't care what we do, y'all. God gave everything. 
Pastor Hatcherson says it like this, God went bankrupt yes, he did. for us. Yes, he, did. he gave everything yes. so that we might have access to everything. And that's a, that's a gracious father. How much more will we give to our children as the father has given to us? Have you ever given a financial gift to your church or a ministry and then you regretted it? I just want to throw that out. You know, I, I was thinking, when as I was preparing this, I probably, I got to be by myself. Nick, I, I hear you over there. Yeah. I mean, have you really ever given and you thought, man, I gave too much today? <laughs> what about to a nonprofit? You know, you got Jimmy Hill Mission and Jesse's Place and all these, you know, places or you get this, the things that come in the mail. And you, you, you're convicted and you say, I'm a give. And you like, you, man, these people got millions of dollars. <laughs> I tell people that come to me, when, especially when I worked in the branch, and Elisa and I know this to be true. We got people who can't afford to give to billion dollar industries, right. but yet it's still they overdraw their account. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, y'all, you're putting money in a pocket that's got holes in it. Mm -hmm. You don't have anything. And the bank is $18.2 billion industry. I mean, that's just a one bank. I shouldn't even wow. say an industry, institution. You needed those $36. <clears throat> that's what that overdraft charge cost you. Mm. And then they add on top of that, wow. if you overdraw in seven days or more. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're going to keep adding. So be careful mm. what you do with your money. $36 is what? It might be 38 Has it gone up? 36 still, some places are 38. Think about it. Have you ever given somebody some money? I'm, this is me. You got somebody that's, that's got the um, little thing on the side of the road and she's looking down. And I roll my window down. Hey, hey, hey. And, I, and the next thing you know, you, you go back on that same block. Hi there. It's currently 1 no. 06 p.m. It's for me to give. Yeah. But I say that because the Bible says for us to be a generous giver. So I want to I want you to know if you felt this, you're not by yourself. Giving is one of the most challenging dis disciplines and can reveal our hearts better than most anything. Giving is one of God's ways of helping us become more like Him. Luke 6 and 38 says, Give and it will be given unto you. Good measure, press down, shake it together, run over, will what? That's right. He didn't say he's going to do it. He's going to allow others to do it. But with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. There are keys to giving. Giving is not supposed to be about us. Yet, we can oftentimes make it about us. It's an opportunity to give. Uh, and I'm going to say, as I thought about this one, opportunities to give are wonderfully designed by God for us to grow and to, to, to mature in our faith walk. Oftentimes, giving, it does depend on our faith level. Otherwise, we won't do it. Because we'll say, I can't. I ain't. I can't afford it. I won't. But it depends on our faith. What is faith? Faith is totally relying on God. I oftentimes use the example. When you walk into a room and you see a chair, you don't examine it. You don't pick it up and check all the legs and make sure they ain't broke. You, don't, you make sure the seat is connected. Typically, you just go in and do what? Sit down. Sit down. That's faith. That's our reliance on the Holy Spirit. We let him do his work. It's not abnormal to get it wrong sometimes. God is at work in us. We are work in progress. Don't become discouraged when you, don't, you haven't mastered these principles. Don't be guilty. Don't be held hostage when you, when you don't give. Find that you have not done what you felt like you were supposed to do. Ask the Lord to forgive you. And I, I use that word repent. 
To repent is to have a change of mind. Not just a change of mind, but then you do a turn. That's right. A change of heart. You turn from that way and you turn to the Lord so that he can lead you. Talk to God about the attitude and the thoughts of your heart. Throughout the Bible, we're introduced to financial principles. A principle is similar to a foundation. It's a fundamental truth that serves as the foundation for a system of beliefs or behaviors. God's intent is for these principles, these truths, to guide our beliefs and behaviors so that his blessings and favor can flow into our lives throughout to others. Next, as we open up the second session of, of today's time, I want us to look at what happens when the right principles are not followed and carried out. This is what I was telling you about, the statistics, the numbers, what they really mean. 95% of millennials are saving less than the recommended amount to stay on track for retirement. 95%. No, that means it's only 5% that are reaching the goals. That's an alarming number to me. Brother Perry. I would say this, the statistics on that is very true with the 95%. Most of the millennials that I've spoken with, and I guess the mindset needs to change because when we learn the finances of life, they are relying on us to pass away yeah. and leave a substantial inheritance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have experienced that with several already. But they have for a rude awakening. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, so much. And you're exactly right. You know, they're spending all they can and sitting on top of the can. <laughs> We got to be careful. That, the best time to start planning for retirement is when you're younger. In your 20s, it's a great time to start. I think my son can attest to the fact that the, uh, as you keep living, your expenses grow, your responsibilities grow, and it's harder to put that money away or aside as you have planned on it. In, there's a rising cost to inflation or in, 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 of, of, of inflation. And it's best to start saving and investing early to reduce the strain on the lifestyle you want to live later on in life. Starting early helps you to not have to push back the retirement date unless you just enjoy getting up, going to work every single morning. And I know one of the things somebody was going to ask me is, so well, how do I know if I'm on track? At the very bottom, I got this site, Savology. There's a free retirement calculator to help you determine your retirement age, your retirement income, and what you can do to improve your retirement outlook. So for those of you that's thinking like, I want to retire at this age, how do I get there? Am I on track? Do I need to do something different? Go to Savology. It, there's a free tool to help you. 69% of households have less than a thousand dollars in an emergency fund. 69 percent. More people are living in debt up to the yang yang, as people say, because they don't have that special fund set aside to take care of those important opportunities to, that present themselves. <laughs> The majority of Americans are not saving enough to protect themselves in case of a financial crisis or an emergency or an opportunity, as I call them, car repairs. If you had, if you were involved in an accident, God forbid, today, and your your insurance says that car that you have, which is a, a 1994 Chevrolet Cavalier, I don't know, is it Cavalier? Okay. They said we're only going to give you $500. You go to the dealership but your credit is not where it needs to be. The dealership says we can't do the financing, but if you got the cash, you can get you a car today. How many of you can walk on the lot today and get that car? That's the emergency fund that I'm talking about. Medical expenses, aging parents. My parents, are, my mom is in Wetumpka, my mother and father-in-law are in the Carolinas. If there's an emergency that comes up, how quickly can I grab a plane ticket and get there to them? It's a six-hour drive. Mm -hmm. And gas is 
And gas, you're exactly right. Can I go to the rental um, car, um, auto rental place and get a car? Those are expenses, y'all, that come up more often than not. Our children needs money. I mean, <laughs> 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 how do you get bailing them out? <laughs> you, you, exactly, we need things ourselves. You know, sometimes it's a want, but other times there's a need. Education. If your job said today, in order for you to get promoted to this level, uh, you need to go back to school, how can you get there without taking out a student loan? You just want to pay the tuition. All important questions. There's so much. There's no such thing as having too much money in an emergency fund. 34% of Americans have zero dollars in savings. Zero. Some people don't even have a savings account. Why? Because the banks aren't paying any interest. I hear you. They're not. But that, does that mean that you don't need to put some away? I put it under my mattress. Fire. <laughs> Thieves. Robbers. Banks are, oh, I work for the bank. Strike <laughs> 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 this one off the record. <laughs> yeah. Far too often, many rely on credit cards, which mean they take on more debt, which is putting them in an even worse financial position. I'm gonna go back on that one. I gotta get myself out of the mud on this one when I was about to talk about the banks. You, your paycheck goes into the bank. That money may sit in, there, in that account for a day or two. Every single day, the bank is investing your money. Why are you not? Every single day, billions of dollars are paid into the market. Not for you, not on your behalf, but so that they can be synergistic. They can hire more people. They can build better businesses, more businesses. Why are we not doing the same? Yo, we got work to do. Yes. There's a great level of, of, of um, need in our communities. Up to 64% of households age 50 plus don't have estate plans. And an estimated 90% of households are underinsured. 83% of people that set financial goals feel better about their finances after just one year. The average household spends $3,600 more each year due to inflation. To combat inflation, guess what the Federal Reserve is doing? They're raising the interest rates. And in doing that, it has negative consequences um, because it increases the borrowing and the credit card rates, which means that for people who can't afford to buy without spending it on credit, they're hit with a double whammy. Inflation, high debt. We gotta be careful about these things, y'all. We gotta be wise. Bridget and I had a conversation yesterday, and I was, I think Mary, a couple years ago, we were in a seminar at the church. You asked the question about credit cards. Do I cut my credit cards up? I think was your question. And I think, I believe asking, I asked the question, are you using those cards to build your business? If you're not using those cars to build your business, <clears throat> I'm gonna say, not cut them up, put them, put them away. Put them in the drawer, but if you find yourself continuously going back to that drawer and it's not adding any value to your business or even your lifestyle for the kingdom's good, go ahead and cut them up. Sometimes it's gonna take money to make money. Not sometimes, it takes money to make money anyway. As a result, we have to know when the money that's being taken is also money that's being made. 22 million jobs were lost between February and April of 2020. Do y'all remember what happened? The unemployment rate shot up 14.8%. 14, the number of families receiving federal food assistance jumped 
15% in just three months. And many households could no longer pay their rent. January of this year, two years later, inequality has only gotten worse during the pandemic. A billionaire is made every 26 minutes, 26 hours. Inequality contributes to the death of one person every four seconds. The rich are getting richer, while the wealth and the income of 99% of the rest of the world is plummeting. Joshua says it like this, in 24 and 15, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What Joshua has done is he's reminded Israel of what God has already done for them. And he says, every person has a choice to make, and the choice is up to you, but I'm telling you what my choice is. I'm choosing God. Today, I want us to pause for just a minute, and everybody has a pen, and everybody has um, some notes. Take your notes, take your pen, put it in your phone, and write out for you your choice. I don't even want to see it. I just want you to write out your choice. <coughs> Will you choose this day whom you'll serve, whether it be God or whether it be money? What's your choice? As you're choosing, let us pray. Heavenly Father, it's in the name of Jesus that we come before you right now. First of all, we come thanking you for this glorious opportunity that you've given us to hear, to share, to understand, but most of all, to apply your word to our lives. We know that it's not about us, but it's about the kingdom. And so God, make us citizens of the kingdom who think beyond the right now. Heaven is in our view. Eternity, God, we're making preparations for it. And so help us now to forget those things that are behind as we press forward to those things that are present. And God, as we live out our lives for the, for the glory of God, that others might see you through us. Consecrate us today that we might hear from you, God. Open up our understanding that we might know what you want us to understand and to do so that we, God, might be better for the kingdom's good. Lord, we thank you. We thank you in Jesus' name. The master's plan for obedient living, wealth building principles. A steward is one who manages another's resources. Each of us is a manager. We're not the owner, that's God. We are managing the plan that he has for us. Money is a training ground for God to develop us and to determine if we can be trusted with what he has given us. Luke, 11, Luke 16 and 11 says, if therefore you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous mammon, who will entrust the true riches to you? Is God going to do it? Mm -hmm. If, he, if you can't be trusted in this area, is he going to trust you with this? This is a little thing. Money is a tool. It can be used in so many various ways. We're God's hands. We're God's feet. How do we use what God has given us? In every reference in scripture, as it relates to money, God promises that as we give, so it will be what? Yeah, and there are just a couple of scriptures that I put there. There are so many more. Matthew 25, a chapter that deals with the second coming of Christ, it reveals a lot of things like God will entrust us with um, within our own ability and not beyond it. I think I said that earlier, right? God is the owner and has the right to recover what he has given to us to manage. God disapproves of slothfulness. What did he say to the one that came back with that one talent? He says, you're wicked. You're slothful. He expects what? Oh, one more time. He expects increase. That's right. If he gives it to us, 
He wants it to multiply. Just like with husband and wives. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know my mindset. That multiplication is to be achieved according to ability. God expects those who have the ability to invest to do so, but he also expects the return of what is given. This involves wisdom in finances. Following the master's plan. Step one. I think I got five steps that I'm going to go through really fast. Before I go into those, I want to I stop for just a minute. What kind of questions we got? Any comments? Any thoughts? Nothing? All right. So principle number one. God is. Principle number two. <laughs> what, what is it? <laughs> principle number two. Money is about discipleship. And principle number three. Being Very good. I want us to be reminded of those principles. Give. Be a disciple. But remember, God is our source. Before um, I go into the second half, I want to do a. I want to. I want to do something. Each one of you have a little card, right? They gave this, them back to me. Oh, they gave back. They already wrote them out. Yeah. All right. What I've asked. Oh, yes, ma'am, sister wife. If you haven't given them to Bridget, if you'll hold them up, I want to make sure she gets those. I wanted everybody to give me a name of a, a child that's going off to school. One of uh, the ladies in our church. She's an. She's an amazing uh, craft craftsman, I guess I'll call her. She does everything from um, gift baskets to um, wreaths. And she's made some gift baskets for me to give away on today. And I want to give this these baskets to one child that's going off to school, whether it be high school this year or college this year. Bridget's going to shake it up and she's going to pull that name. This is the gift that um, we're giving. So whoever's child that is, they get these supplies that they'll need for school this year. You can flip it over. And just, and just put a name on it. Don't you think about why you're choosing this child? It can be your own, and that's totally okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I don't know about that one. I have one. I think get one. Alisa, will you come and pull, pull the name? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. God got it too. You gotta know it. <laughs> Take it up good. Don't try as hard to move. Yeah, it's right here. I'm trying to flip them over. You can't see them. Just close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> they ain't flipping over. <laughs> You know, typically I would say now is the best time to start buying up a lot of real estate. Mr. Jenner, I would know more on the real estate side of it. I don't deal with a lot of real estate, but because of the housing market is so elevated at this time, 
I don't know exactly with the real estate, are you buying at a higher value? I mean, at a higher price than the value of the house right now? Well, the fact that the market uh, is fluctuating such as it is, it's going to depend on the circumstances. It's going to depend on the deal. But when you approach investments, you don't just pick an investment and say, uh, I'm going to invest in that. You have to figure out what's right for you. Um, for instance, a lady called me the other day and she wanted to invest in silver and gold. But when I began asking her about what else are you doing, she couldn't explain that. So that meant that she was not to go near silver and gold. That's right. So it's not the investment as much as it is what you're trying to accomplish. And then it'll determine what you should be investing in. Real estate is always a good thing to invest in if it's right for you at that time. You got a question since my, I see the wheels turning. What, is, what does it mean? I'm marinating on what he's saying. <laughs> what does it mean for it to be right for you? You know, what, that, it means going back to a plan to say, you know, take a snapshot of where you are now. Determine where it is that you're wanting to go. Then, at that point, particular investments are going to stand out as to be the vehicles that you need to get there. Real estate may be in that answer, but you just don't say, well, I heard a story on the, on, you know, the news and real estate is a good deal. That may not be for you. You have to determine what fits for you. Are you saying that you need to do your diligent research? <coughs> Absolutely. You have to determine where you are, what you've got, what you're working with, what your goals are, and that determines what you should be in, uh, investing in. Right. Well, I can understand on that part where you say, am I uh, willing to buy up property or houses? I, I guess the reason I'm saying this now and thinking about it is because I noticed even coming over this way, that I see a lot of signs, even in my neighborhood, we buy houses. And uh, you find a lot of commercials, uh, we're willing to buy as is and whatever, whatever. But my thing is, if you have a uh, property already, is it the investment of holding or letting go at this, you know what I'm saying? Because the way the market is, you know, real estate is real. You know what I'm saying? Okay, my answer is the same. You don't just, you just don't look at a thing by itself sitting there. Okay. You, you have to connect it to what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Okay. It may be that based on where you are, you should unload an asset. Could be real estate. Mm -hmm. It may be where you are that you need to buy real estate. But you have to go back to the beginning okay. and work your way back up to that. It's not something that's sitting there all by itself. It connects to something, and you want to determine what it's connecting to. That is you, your goals, your objectives, and what you've got to work with. Okay. Well, sometimes real estate connects, is connecting to your loved one that has passed on. You don't want to let it go. But you, what are you doing to keep it up? That may be something that you want to let, you need to let go. And uh, and I know it would be hard to do, but I've run into that a lot, people coming in the bank, and they're, one, they're not wanting to let go of their parents' home. They're not wanting to let go because it means so much to them. But what are you paying out? What are you, you know, doing to keep it up? You're paying this. You're paying, can you afford to do that? Yeah. If you can't afford to do that, you need to just go ahead and pray about it, ask God to give you peace and, you know, get rid of it. And I had one lady, she sold her mom's house just the other day um, for 200 and some thousand. Well, somebody bought it for that, but they flipped it and they sold it for 500,000. But they put a lot into it. So they may not have made but $50,000 off of that deal because of what they put in there. So we don't want to let go of a lot of things because they, they're sentimental. I have people coming in the bank and they bring it in their parents' coin or uh, the collection that don't mean nothing to them, but it meant something to their parents. So they're coming in and they're taking stuff and they're you know, getting the money for it. Like, I don't want to deal with this. That wasn't for them. So like Mr. Jim Wright said, if it don't fit you, don't do it. But if it fits you, go ahead and do it. Because you got to really know what you're doing before you do it. 
Right. And, and just to continue on that note, you don't do these things emotionally. Right. You, you have to do it based on a plan. You have to do it based on what makes sense. Are, are the numbers adding up? That's where you make those kinds of decisions because your emotions will really get you in hot water, just as Ms. Walker said. If you wait until situations are uh, a person, a, 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 a loved one passes away, you're going to make all kinds of crazy decisions because you're so emotional. Do these things beforehand because in that way you can approach them with a good sound mind because you've already thought through these things. And when it's done, it's done. Yeah. <laughs> Thank y'all. Thank you. Okay. And one of the things I agree with both of them on that you have to really weigh your options to see if it's a liability or it's going to be an asset. Yeah. If you sit there just to have something as sentimental as uh, Mr. Jen Rice said, emotionally, you can have a large piece of property, but what are the taxes on it? Mm -hmm. Are you willing to pay the taxes on it to let it sit there? Are you willing to take the property and develop it so that it will be an asset, not only for you, but family members? Mm -hmm. Things like that you really have to consider. And then you like to, have to look at your funding. Mm -hmm. Do you have the funds available to go into the development where you bring family in? And sometimes, you know, as this race, we don't want to share. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the most difficult things to do to bring family in and say, look, this is what we need to be. I've had several situations like that last week in Mobile as well as another place that they got the property, but I said, what is your intent? Right. Well, I'm just going to hold it. Hold it. What is it costing you to hold it? Yeah. You have a living expense here, but yet still you're drawing down from that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have nothing coming in and more going out, yeah. surely down the line, something is going to happen mm -hmm. and it's not going to be to your advantage. You're going to go lacking in some areas. Exactly. I, I totally agree. Any, anybody else? Great, great points. Uh, just listening, because I'm going through all of that. Yeah. And I was talking to my aunt in Uniontown, and she was telling me how we can't afford to pay those taxes, and we we're walking away from it. And they are coming in, and they're buying. I mean, they have bought a whole lot of property around my, my parents' property in Bonsdale. I mean, I get letters constantly. <laughs> want to buy even here the property here they're begging for it because it's right there by the airport mm -hmm. and i had someone who was in real estate said so walk away from it stop paying the taxes i'm like no i'm not gonna do that mm -hmm. i'm not gonna do that because i got hundreds of people sending me letters mm -hmm. calling me and saying oh we want to buy it we'll give you whatever you want you want today you know we well, i haven't put nobody in it you know whatever you're asking for we'll give it to you today so I, I got all the kids. I said, hey, by the time I get this together, I'll probably be going to the grave. Mm -hmm. Y'all need to do this. So they say, hey, let's do a bed and breakfast. Mm -hmm. So that I got them on board and said, hey, we need to do something with this. I'll keep paying the taxes yeah. until I decide to kick up out of here. And if, if I kick up out of here, nobody else is can. Mm -hmm. But everybody is calling me. And, and sending me cards and letters begging for the property. Mm -hmm. So I know it's going to be worth something on down the road. Yeah. But I have people, other people said, girl, stop that. Don't pay for that. Walk away from it. Mm -hmm. No. And that's what they have done down in Uniontown mm -hmm. and all of the black that they have walked away mm -hmm. from property. Mm -hmm. And if you go down there during the holidays, you're like, what is that? In the dark, you see the lights and the big houses. Mm -hmm. Man, they have bought it. Mm -hmm. uh, what is this catfish ponds? Yeah. You know, catfish yes. farms yes. every everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just they've taken it mm -hmm. because we walked away from and, it. And you know, as you're saying that, Mary, the one thing I keep thinking about is, and our pastor constantly preach and teach this, and and I know it probably sounds like a broken record, but in many of our urban communities. A lot of the property, you know, was owned by our parents and the children have moved into other communities and neighborhoods and 